hello to my mom and my dad. My name is uh, Toby Fife, and I'm going to be the uh, moderator of this session. Uh, a couple of housekeeping announcements I've been asked to give you first. Uh, lost and found, please check with the registration desk if you have misplaced anything. A reminder for those of you who are leaving, well, I guess you'll all be leaving at some point, but at any time, <laughs> would you complete the evaluation forms, please? Uh, there will be an early start tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock, just like there was an early start today at 9 o'clock, but this time with the uh, Right Honourable Paul Martin. And if anyone would like a copy of the Tom Jenkins book, please give your name to the registration desk. I'm not quite sure what they're going to do with it, but anyway, <laughs> give it to the registration desk and uh, we'll be good to go. So, tonight uh, we explore the role of the state within the context of this watershed moment called the financial crisis. Not, I should say, to be confused, as others have asked, how did we get into this sorry state? And I'm going to give you sound bites from the last 24 hours that perhaps set a bit of context for this. And the beauty of this is I could only really think in sound bites, and I have the advantage of being able to take them totally out of context in order to suit the panel. <laughs> so when we were talking about a water, uh, watershed moment, I remember that Margaret McMillan said that there comes a time when we have to look at our assumptions such as how do we run ourselves? Do we have the capacity to respond? And Angela Reddick reminded us of the stress of transition. On dealing with the financial crisis, Finance Minister Flaherty asked, how much does government want to get involved in the private sector? He then told us he believed the role of government when the private sector fails is to act in the interests of Canadians and told us, I am a pragmatist. And Nick LePan reminded us that we have to know who we are as an organization, so as a government, perhaps in this context, uh, referring to roles, responsibilities, the courage to examine what he called blemishes, and to provide the correct adult supervision. So we might say that since the crisis, the debate over the role of the state in our lives has been growing, certainly in the United States, in this country as well. So although they don't know it yet, our panelists are going to be exploring some of the following questions. So, Alex is taking notes, God bless him. Okay. How the financial crisis has affected both how Canadians and Americans view the role of the state. Do they want more government or do they now want less? What is the role of the state in the free market economy? And should it be directly involved or operate more at arm's length through, uh, with uh, sectors or should it not be involved at all? And we heard that discussion back and forth on the innovation session this afternoon. And on what basis does or should government make decisions? What are the rights and freedoms of the citizens relative to government? So our three panelists today, Tom Flanagan at the far left is professor of political science. <laughs> oh, oh, let's try that again. That remark reminds me that context is everything. <laughs> so, let us try this again. Sitting at the far left, and speaking, I'm sure, correctly or rightly, we have Professor Tom Flanagan, who is a professor of political science at the University of Calgary, and a former senior communications advisor for the Conservative Party of Canada, I'm not going to go through all three of our panelists' uh, biographies. You have them. Uh, Tom is known, though, very much as a scholar for some of the books he has written, including his book, First Nations, Second Thoughts, which received a number of prizes, a book he wrote on his experience working for Preston Manning, and the book he wrote uh, referring to uh, when he managed Stephen Harper's campaigns uh, and, uh, some of the and the Conservative Party campaigns. Armin Yalnesian, in the middle... Uh, okay, Wait, we're all on the same page here. Where she is sitting, in the middle, is a senior economist with the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. She has uh, joined in 2008 to advance the work of the Growing Gap Project, and for a number of years has been working on the alternative federal budget since its launch. She was honoured as the first Atkinson Foundation Economic Justice Fellow, and received the Morley Gunderson Prize from the University of Toronto where she obtained her MA in Industrial Relations. And she sits on a number of boards as well. Physically, to my immediate left, 
but to the right of everybody else, we're all on the same page here, okay, is Alex Himmelfarb, who uh, is a former clerk of the Privy Council and secretary to cabinet. He, uh, right now, however, is a director of the Glendon School of Public Administration and International Affairs at York University, a sterling college, I can tell you from personal experience, and also leads the uh, Center for Global Challenges. Uh, he has done many functions in um, the public service, and uh, after leaving as Clerk of the Privy Council and Secretary to Cabinet, uh, he was uh, nominated as Ambassador to Canada to uh, Italy. Our order is going to be as follows. Mr. Flanagan, Armin, and Alex are going to uh, start. They will have 20 minutes. Uh, we'll give a two-minute signal, as we have agreed. Then we will take a break, as per the tradition, and we will open the... Uh, floor to uh, questions. So, Tom, would you like to come up here? Okay. Well, last night, Margaret McMillan said that uh, the problem with history is that it offers too many lessons. I'm not sure I would say too many, but it certainly offers a lot of lessons. And uh, tonight in my time, I would like to uh, share with you some of the lessons that I would draw from recent history. Now, the first point I would make is uh, last night, uh, Margaret repeatedly uh, referred to the last 30 years in somewhat dismissive terms and suggested that we, we somehow have to reevaluate uh, what has happened uh, in the last 30 years. Well, I was a bit troubled by that. Uh, you know, the last 30 years start in 1980, so the period immediately preceding that would be the 70s. Uh, do you remember the 70s? Polyester suits and, uh, and big hair, but more seriously for our discussion, um, stagflation, which meant uh, chronic double-digit inflation as well as chronic double-digit unemployment, uh, wage and price controls in Canada proposed by the Conservative Party, then enacted by the Liberal Party, uh, communist adventurism in the Third World, wars in Angola, Mozambique, um, Nicaragua, Afghanistan, and other countries that slipped my mind. Uh, the 70s were actually a very difficult uh, time, and things started to get remarkably better in the 1980s with new leadership in the Western world. Um, resistance to communist expansionism, which led to the collapse of the Soviet bloc, and there's probably never been a, well, that may be an exaggeration, but this is one of the most uh, fortunate things that has ever happened to the human race is the uh, destruction of that colossal system of tyranny. Um, and then in the Western world, in terms of domestic policy, uh, a return to the fundamentals of a market economy, domestic policy in countries such as the United States, Great Britain, and Canada, at slightly different times in each country, but began to uh, emphasize such things as stable money, reducing the rate of inflation uh, down to something tolerable, control the money supply, um, balanced budgets as a goal of public policy, uh, lower tax rates, uh, privatization in Canada of what we call crown corporations, uh, deregulation, at least partially, things like uh, telephone uh, tariffs and uh, air travel, a couple of examples, and the promotion of free trade. Uh, the results uh, were nothing short of phenomenal, I would say. Um, just to give you a couple of examples, uh, the last 30 years have seen the lifting or the climbing is probably a better term of at least a billion people across the world out of poverty as countries like China and India, only the two biggest examples, but uh, a number of other countries in the third world abandoned the uh, vision, or as I would see it, the mirage of socialism and opened themselves up to a market economy. And, it, and we have seen the results of China becoming in the factory to the world. And um, of course, China is now becoming a high wage area and they're outsourcing uh, work to Bangladesh and, and so on. I mean, it's all part of the process of development. Uh, but this is the, uh, one of the single greatest uh, leaps of progress uh, in, in, in the history of the human race. This many people in such a short period of time would be elevated 
out of poverty. And how did that happen? It didn't happen out of foreign aid. It didn't happen because Canada raised its percentage of gross national product devoted to foreign aid from 0 0.28 to 0 0.29. Uh, it happened because the market uh, system was extended around the world and people started to take advantage of it. Um, also, uh, uh, probably not as important, but still very important, uh, in the last 30 years we have seen wave after wave of technical innovation. Uh, the personal computer, the cell phone, the digital camera, the internet, uh, Nintendo. Uh, just had a uh, visit a couple of weeks ago from our two grandsons, 17 and 116, and when we weren't out fishing, they could play Nintendo with each other, uh, even in spite of an age difference. Um, but, you know, more seriously, these uh, technical innovations have revolutionized the conduct of business around the world. This would not have happened without the uh, privatization of telecoms and without the deregulation of the industry, which has um, you know, gotten rid of the old black telephone. Uh, so, I, in, in contrast to what we heard last night, I regard the last 30 years as one of the most optimistic periods in human history. And I don't think we need to reevaluate where we were going, uh, what we were doing. I do think, though, we have to ask uh, how and why did the party end? Why did we seem to come up against a wall at the end of this, uh, of this recent decade? And uh, I think we've heard some of the explanations uh, in other presentations uh, at this conference, and I won't try and uh, summarize them all, but just to mention them. Uh, the inevitability of periodic recessions in a market economy. This has been going on for 200 years. It shouldn't surprise us. All parties end. Uh, it's really just a question of, uh, of, of what the closing is like and how severe it is. Um, another very cogent point that was made today was that financial innovation got ahead of the, uh, of the necessary regulation. So we had new products, new kinds of derivatives uh, being sold around the world. Uh, there wasn't proper disclosure of information, I think. People perhaps didn't know exactly what they were buying. And uh, in the end, they, uh, uh, this, this backfired. Uh, so there was a governmental failure there. Um, and I'm not saying that in a judgmental sense that I could have done better. I'm just saying government did not keep up with the, the pace of innovation in that respect. And then uh, thirdly, a point that has been alluded to uh, but hasn't been given the emphasis that it deserves is the well-intentioned but extremely unwise policy pursued in the United States of uh, forcing financial institutions uh, to make subprime loans in the name of uh, ma making home ownership more affordable. This is a, a, a spin-off of racial politics in the United States. That, I mean, there may have been other countries in the world that were also promoting uh, loaning on poor terms, but because of the size of the United States, size of its market, it was far more important there. And it's not surprising then that the financial meltdown when it came started in the United States uh, mortgage field and then spread around the world because financial institutions around the world had, uh, uh, had bought these uh, securitized debt. Uh, this was not a market failure. This was a government failure. It wasn't the banks that wanted to make loans on bad terms. The banks had to be forced into it by governments. And again, it was a, uh, a bipartisan effort. You can trace this back, the roots of it, to the Carter administration in the late 70s. But both, uh, both parties participated at various times enthusiastically in, uh, in driving this forward because they found political, uh, political benefit in it. So the, uh, the financial meltdown of the, of the last few years, in my view, uh, is more due to government failure than to market failure. Why is Canada doing relatively well now? Um, again, some of the answers have been given uh, throughout the course of our, our sessions. Uh, our government um, never created such a real estate bubble as was created in the United States. Uh, there, there, were, there was a little experimentation with subprime instruments, but the governments drew back. We don't have the same kind of racial politics in Canada that to, uh, to drive that issue as they do in the United States. And so we, um, there was a real estate bubble in Canada, but it wasn't nearly of the dimensions that was in the United States, so we didn't have nearly as much 
bad debt to deal with. Also, our financial uh, position was stronger, or I should say our fiscal position was stronger in Canada because we had learned uh, from the experience that began in the 1970s and carried on through the, uh, through the 80s and into the early 90s of uh, running year after year of, uh, of unbalanced budgets. Um, and again, uh, the, uh, the cure to this, the remediation, really came from all parties when you look at it. Um, the conservative government of Brian Mulroney signaled the problem, wasn't able to deal with it fully, did deal with it partially. The Reform Party put on additional pressure. Uh, the NDP in Saskatchewan was actually the first provincial government to get its uh, financial affairs in order. And ultimately, it was the Liberal Party that seized the nettle when it was in in power, so I think all parties can take uh, uh, a share of the of the credit for dealing with it. But having had such a serious problem of our own, and then having dealt with it relatively recently, we were more aware of the uh, of the problems of government debt. And uh, so, while other countries were increasing their government debt in the last uh, 15 years, we were decreasing our government debt up up until the last couple of years. So that. Um, we were in a relatively good position when we started. We didn't have the problem of bad mortgages, debt to nearly the extent that some other countries did, and our government's fiscal position was relatively strong. Then another thing I, th I think that needs to be pointed out is that uh, our governmental measures have succeeded, I believe, uh, precisely because they are relatively modest. We have been running uh, in the name of stimulus, we've been running uh, deficit of 3 or 4% of uh, GDP. Uh, my personal opinion, that's too much. But uh, compared to countries like the United States or Great Britain or you know, some of the basket cases like Greece, this is really small potatoes. And starting from our very low uh, accumulated uh, government debt, which we had paid down, uh, you know, we've been able to afford this relatively easily. So our government's... Uh, the stimulus package was relatively modest. It was one important point. Second important point, it was short term. It was clearly announced that it would just be for, uh, for two years and then government would re return to the more tried and tested uh, path of, uh, of fiscal responsibility. And there was an exit strategy laid out at the beginning as to how government would get out of this. And also importantly, um, there was uh, there were very few scary structural reforms attached to this. Most of the stimulus package was pretty conventional stuff of, uh, of, of uh, you know, putting new roofs on hockey centers, as the minister said uh, this morning. There weren't grand pronouncements about uh, uh, restructuring the financial system, changing the, uh, the medical system or whatever. Um, so my point is that our... Canadian approach to stimulus was um, relatively modest, and it was not disturbing. People could see that we, there would be a return to the, a more normal path, and uh, they weren't scared with, uh, with, with lots of unknowns about the future. So confidence has, consumer confidence has remained relatively high in Canada. Investor confidence has remained relatively high, and I think we've seen the... Uh, the benefits of that, and if we compare that with the bigger and more destabilizing stimulus packages uh, that have been announced in other countries, and uh, like in the United States, for example, which obviously we always will take that as our point of comparison, a far bigger package and continuing debate as to how long it's going to be extended and tied into, um, you know, uh, monumental reforms of this and that, some of which will happen, some, some of which won't. Uh, but confidence in the United States has been much more shaken by what, by what government has done. So in Canada, I think we avoided those uh, errors. And uh, again, interestingly, it was basically a bipartisan stimulus package. Um, I think the government's intrinsic preference would have been to have much less of a stimulus package, but politically with a minority government, they had to cater to liberal preferences. And so they basically found the position of the median voter of a stimulus package that could be supported by both sides of the uh, 
both sides of the aisle. It's a basically the kind of stimulus package that a r responsible liberal government probably would have enacted if it had been in power, and we can argue about the details. But politically, that was a good formula to have something that could be could command uh, at least grudging, uh, uh, if not support, at least acquiescence from, um, from both sides of the House. So uh, what's the big lesson here? I said I would draw some... Uh, some lessons in my reading of, uh, of the history. Um, my reading of it is that uh, we were basically on track in the 1980s, 1990s, and the year 2000, and uh, when governments of all persuasions were in power, actually whether it was the um, Reagan Republicans in the United States or the Clinton Democrats, the uh, um, conservatives or liberal, uh, labor in Britain, conservatives or liberals uh, in, in Canada. I mean, they're all pointing in the same direction when they governed, not necessarily when they were in opposition, but when they actually governed, they were pointing in the same direction. And uh, they were pursuing a policy of, uh, of market fundamentals, not perfectly, but uh, in, in that direction. Uh, and it worked. I said, and, and the world has been transformed as a result of it. The world today is vastly different. Who was it who pointed to the importance of the G20? Well, there would be no G20 if it hadn't been for the market uh, revolution of the last uh, uh, three, uh, three decades. India and China would be unimportant economic backwaters waters as they used to be. It's only because they have embraced the market that they have uh, become important world powers, as they indeed they deserve to be. So uh, the world has been transformed. Uh, the party came to an end through government failure, in my view. But th that doesn't mean that we should abandon what worked so well for 30 years. It means that we should fix what we did wrong. And we did some things wrong, as I tried to lay out. And we should fix those. And, uh, and, and we should get back on track. So what should government do? And that's the question of the panel. Uh, well. Uh, I go to the most up-to-date source on this that I can find, Adam Smith's Wealth of Nations, uh, 1776. <laughs> I think it says, uh, as valid now as it ever was. Some, sometimes people get it right, and it stays right. Adam Smith said that there are, there are three functions of government. The first is to protect society from uh, external attack, so national defense. And in Canada, that means doing it in concert with our allies, and it may mean buying expensive new stealth uh, aircraft, which Canada might not need if it were a freestanding power, but we are part of an alliance, uh, and uh, we have to move in concert, uh, in concert with them. But that's the basic thing, protecting, uh, maintaining our, our sovereignty and our independence. Secondly, what Smith called an exact administration of justice enforcing necessary rules of conduct, uh, rules of property, rules of contract, uh, all sorts of rules of, of conduct that are necessary uh, for a free society and which are not self-enforcing and which need uh, a governmental enforcement, and we have to continue to do that. And then thirdly, the provision, and I don't have uh, Smith's exact words with me, but what today in the jargon of economics today would be called public goods. Uh, Smith said, uh, you know, doing things that it's not in the interest of any individual entrepreneur to provide. Because of externalities and spillovers, there are some things that uh, we haven't yet figured out and maybe never will be able to uh, provide for sale through a market. And so we provide them by means of government, uh, sometimes direct provision from tax revenue, sometimes through government regulation. But there are certain public goods which um, uh, government has to provide. So that's the formula. And uh, that's the direction we should be going, and we were moving in that direction for the last three decades. We didn't get all the way back to Adam Smith, unfortunately, but we made considerable progress in going backwards, and uh, we saw the great uh, benefits of that. So uh, I think we should stick with what worked. It's a fix, fix what a uh, couple of things that didn't work. Stick with what demonstrably uh, did work. Let's fix our government failures. Let's get back on track. And what would this mean for an agenda for Canada? Well, I was very inspired by what our businessman friend Tom Jenkins said at, uh, uh, in the afternoon panel, that, yeah, we have a problem with productivity and competitiveness in Canada and innovation. And what is the problem? Well, the real problem 
is that for various reasons we have chosen to shield large areas of our economy from competition. Uh, media, television, radio, newspaper, um, transportation, uh, air travel, um, agriculture, uh, uh, supply marketing, the wheat board, uh, medical care. We have huge areas of our economy which, in which we have set up barriers that um, insulate them from competing with best practices uh, around the world. And so if we're seriously worried about, uh, uh, about this problem of productivity and innovation, I think we should uh, get back to the direction that we were taking of market fundamentals and start to work on tearing down these barriers uh, to, to competition. It's actually quite simple. And beyond that, I don't think we need to have a productivity or an innovation agenda at all. We just have to get the government out of the way of the barriers that it has created and uh, let, uh, let people in business uh, do their jobs, which I think they've demonstrated they can do when they get the opportunity. So I have my eyes firmly fixed on the past. Uh, I think the last 30 years, as I say, worked. Uh, they worked because they were based on the wisdom of uh, a great thinker of 200 years ago. And so let's get uh, move forward by going back there. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you, Toby. And it is an honor to be part of this event, which has been going on since 1931. And an honor to be part of this panel, flanked as I am by two players who spent years at the center of the political game. Tom Flanagan, a political scientist who helped plan and shape the rise of the new right in Canada. And Alex Himmelfarb, who became Canada's top public servant after decades of service on the merit of his ability to provide that service irrespective of the part, uh, politics of the party in power. Now, I have no idea how the game works at the center. My perspective on the role of government that I'm going to provide you comes not from the study or the practice of politics, but from my insights as an economist. And tonight, I hope to show how the events leading to and following from what has been dubbed the Great Recession of 2008 illuminated a very clear path, not only for the Canadian government, but for all governments as to their role. And this path was initially pursued here. But now the government of, the Prime Minister, uh, the government of Prime Minister Stephen Harper has forged ahead on an altogether different trajectory, one very heavy on spending on military and security while preaching austerity, and more subtly, one that is reshaping the way we collect and share information in our society, particularly official information. This trajectory, I would contend, is going to have far-reaching consequences for both prosperity and democracy in the coming years. Now, in the next few moments with you, I'm going to focus on the significance of this recession, the nature of the emerging recovery, the challenges ahead, and how all these factors could or should shape the role of government because this certainly has not been a routine business cycle, before, during, or after the downturn. Before the recession hit, the Canadian economy was riding high. It was cresting on a very rare decade of sustained and rapid growth, not seen since the 1960s. By 2005, our relatively small nation of 33 million people and 16 million workers became the ninth largest economy in the world. Between 1997 and 2007, Canada's job, tra job creation track record outpaced that of any other large advanced nation, in the G8 anyway. Unemployment rates had dropped to levels last seen in 1972. Stubbornly high poverty rates had just started to come down. Median incomes, which had been stagnant for 30 long years, had finally started to inch above their levels in 1980. Darker themes were also present, for sure, and they have been growing in an era of easy money and tax cuts, as we would soon see. But 
If you went on these macroeconomic indicators that I just said, you could easily be forgiven for saying this is as good as it gets. Then along came the financial market meltdown of 2008. It was a contagion that spread from Wall Street to Main Street, pulling the global economy off of a cliff and Canada with it. Starting in October of 2008, almost half a million permanent and full-time jobs vanished from the Canadian job market in a short six months. That was the fastest and deepest contraction of the labor market in seven decades. The recession came on the heels of two decades of a policy shift that systematically for favored market-based solutions and reduced government intervention. Notably, Canada did not change or weaken its system of financial regulation. And our cautious nature, at least in comparison with our American confrere, proved to be a real boon to us. But we pursued many of the same objectives as our neighbors to the south. Increasingly free trade, cuts to income supports, deregulation, privatization. These were the orders of the day when it came to public policy. The result of this massive recasting of the purpose of the state was that ordinary Canadians, suddenly faced with the most brutal recession since the Second World War, were also more exposed to the economic risks of joblessness than at any time since the Second World War. Let me give you a picture of this risk. By late 2008, as the economic storm descended on Canada, less than half of our unemployed received jobless benefits. That was the same level it was in 1942 when we implemented unemployment insurance for the first time. Our household savings rates were at levels last seen in 1938. Household indebtedness was breaking every historic record we had ever set. With the average Canadian household owing $1.40 for every dollar of income it brought in. And that was before the crisis hit. It has risen higher since. It really did look like we might be in for a modern day remake of the Great Recession, I'm sorry, of the Great Depression, until governments stepped in. And step in they did. Central banks around the world quickly collaborated to thaw the credit freeze and free flowing cash once again lubricated the gears of the global supply chain. Canada, along with the US, kept the big three automakers in operation with multi-billion dollar loans. The federal government, through CMHC, bought over $69 billion in mortgages from the Canadian banks just to keep them lending to us. Finally, the stimulus package, modest in scale and late in coming in January of 2009, created grounds for more tax breaks, some modest and conditional spending on infrastructure, and some modest and temporary changes to employment insurance. But those jobs that this government did that role of government was critical to stopping the economic freefall in Canada and stabilizing our system. By the summer of 2009, less than a year later, the Canadian labor market had stopped hemorrhaging jobs and started the slow grind upwards. Housing prices did not collapse in Canada. Exports slowly picked up pace, and GDP by the first quarter in 2010 was skipping along. By then, corporate profits before taxes, which had been cut in half, during the recessionary period, were almost three quarters of their previous peak, and they continue to rise. And the stock market is only 14% shy of where it was before the recession hit. By last month, the total number of Canadians with some kind of a job was within striking distance of pre-recession levels. And just a few days ago, the government had reported that, in fact, it may be back in the blank, black long before their own budget plan, the Great Recession. Scary, but over, right? Well, that's what we've been told. And the question is, did we learn anything from the experience? Well, we all know that the triggers that led to the crisis are still with us. They're alive and well and living in Canada as elsewhere. What are these triggers? Over leveraging by investors and households alike. Insufficient and ineffective regulation in many areas. And the endless shifting of risk. Now, today we also learned that we've lost 139,000 full-time jobs of the 400,000 that have been created since the recession began. And we, you need to know that the most rapid form of job creation in the last 18, 19 months has been through temporary work, by which I mean casual, contract, and seasonal work, and the rise of the self-employed. 
This is not a solid foundation for a, re a stable recovery. Nonetheless, the current federal government of Canada believes it is time to get out of the way of the economy and focus on its real job. What is its real job? Tackling the deficit. Time for business as usual. But the business environment is a little bit more ferocious than usual. The wave of corporate consolidation that is sweeping markets around the world is far from over. Sectors as diverse as media, retail, manufacturing, mining, banking, are seeing a shakeout of global proportions. Fewer players than ever before are calling the shots. And here in Canada, the Davids are being squeezed out of a landscape where only Goliaths play, an unbelievably cutthroat landscape marked by high stakes and low prices. Businesses that we've always thought of as recession-proof, like grocery chains, are offering their unionized employees a 25% pay and benefit cut for the privilege of continuing to have a job. So given these facts, pre- and post-recession, what should the role of government be now? Well, there is ample evidence to say that when it comes to the role of the government, yesterday's modus operandi wasn't even good enough for yesterday's good times, let alone tomorrow's bad times. It did not prevent the recession, and it does not prepare us for the future. Business, as usual, is simply not enough. The difficult task of preparing for tomorrow starts by actually looking beyond the business cycle and fixing our sight lines on the three challenges that face us that are of the most enormous consequence, the aging society, climate change, and rising inequality. All three of these challenges are transforming us and they will continue to transform us. Not unique to Canada by any means, the great tsunami, environmental degradation, and a growing gap between the rich and the rest of us will threaten our status quo economically, ecologically, and politically. And it will make us sicker, individually, and as a society, if not addressed. Simply put, these challenges threaten our well-being. They demand a response by government, not after the fact, but in anticipation of these threats. The primary role of government, as Tom has said, is after all the duty to protect, and not just from external threats or inter internal chaos. And indeed, these threats are threats of our own making. Some people will be able to protect themselves from these tough times ahead, as they always have. To rephrase scripture, the rich will always be with us. But these challenges will affect Canadian society in its entirety, poor, middle, and rich, over the next decade or so. And at least in my view, it is the government's duty to rep represent all members of society, not just those who can take care of themselves. Over the arc of history, developed nations have transformed this duty to protect their own citizens into the welfare state. And everywhere, the welfare state was established on a foundation and a principle of full employment, and it has advanced as more of the population has joined the paid workforce. Unemployment rates are higher today in Canada than they were in the 40s and 50s as we developed our welfare state. But more people per household are working today, and in fact, Canadians, particularly young families and recent immigrants, are peddling as fast as they can. But they're not getting ahead like their predecessors did. This generation of workers is better educated and working longer hours than their counterparts a generation ago. Yet, 40% of Canadian households raising children have lower earnings than their counterparts a generation ago. Furthermore, the bottom 70%, a very large majority of Canadian families raising children, are taking home a smaller share of the economic pie than their predecessors a generation ago. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, the top 10%, and in particular the top 1% of the distribution, income distribution, have never had it so good. The past decade of blockbuster growth has delivered a concentration of incomes, wealth, and power, which bring to mind a return of the Gilded Age, complete with robber barons and that wishful mentality that anybody could strike it rich. While many people think that the best social policy is a job, the sad truth is that in, even in our affluent country, working full time and full year does not necessarily lift you out of poverty. And now, even the middle class is looking over its shoulder, 
This is the class, of course, for whom all politicians express great solidarity. But good wages, pensions, and health care benefits are now being framed as unaffordable luxuries that hurt the bottom line, and far too many governments agree. In fact, the middle class worth having and nurturing does no longer seem to be here in Canada. Rather, it is the middle class that is emerging with the emerging economies elsewhere. Meanwhile, questioning multi-million dollar bonuses for corporate executives is suddenly viewed as bad form, or at best, Ill -considered, an ill-considered critique of the free market system. So yes, a recovery is underway, all right. But for reasons, both in this country and around the world, it does not yet look like a trajectory that will lead to economic stability or security. So given the facts, pre- and post-recession, we should actually all be asking a rather basic question. For whom is the economy to be managed? And what is the government's role in that? Because the economy is a marvelously complex social contrivance. We make it up. It is a means for the betterment of the welfare of the citizens who animate it. And it is not an end in itself. Economic growth without widespread prosperity is just not a business as usual track worth getting back onto. If balanced budgets are seen as the primary priority of this government, as has been suggested over and over again by the Prime Minister and his finance minister, the books will be balanced by, number one, not replacing retiring public sector workers, and number two, cutting back on programs. That is a long gamble that the private sector will fill the breach either with good jobs or the services that we need. Now, thus far, my comments about the role of the government have been synonymous with the role of the federal government. And in Canada, as in elsewhere, our governance structures are complex and interlocking. We elect federal, provincial, and municipal governments. And civil society relies on robust and well-governed community-based organizations, businesses, and voluntary associations. But in this mix, the federal government is the alpha dog. It sets the tone. It influences the distribution of power and voice through military spending for external threats and through systems of justice and policing for internal threats. I have to emphasize that no single government of the day determines the role of government, at least not in a modern democracy. The role of government is defined by the com combined effect of all of our opinions as citizens and our expectations of our various institutions of power, both elected and unelected. Indeed, that's what we're witnessing in an unexpected show of political ardor over the nature and significance of the Harper government's decision on the census, which you will note I cunningly did not mention until now. <laughs> the census decision is a metaphor for something much bigger than the role of statistics in society, and I am still struggling to define and understand what that metaphor is. But without question, if the government goes through with its decision to end the mandatory long-form census questionnaire, it will reshape the way decisions can and will be made by all levels of government and by the private sector as well. So, not surprisingly, the, deci the decision has sparked a vigorous debate, a debate that itself is contributing to the shape and evolution of the role of government. If information is power, the final outcome of the census debate will have a real impact on how Canadians are able to participate in their own democracy. But for now, the debate I'm really looking forward to is the one that we're gonna share in a few minutes. Thank you. Thank you, it's great to be here. And uh, with this panel, I think I was chosen to go last for a couple of reasons. One, it gave me time to write some speaking notes. <laughs> but, but even more, more importantly, I think because I'm a career public servant, I, I was expected to, to be able to embrace both speakers without, <laughs> without agreeing with either. As, <laughs> on the one hand, but on the other hand, uh, let me, uh, two quick comments on the speakers, then I will talk a little bit about the crisis 
and I will try in, in the best traditions of public service not to, not to say anything. Um, <laughs> Unlike Tom, I'm reluctant to pick my favorite decade. Uh, if I was to pick a favorite decade, it would probably be the 60s, for, but not for public policy reasons. <laughs> but, for, <laughs> but every decade has its ups and downs. And yeah, I, I understand that, that, that uh, a rising tide lifts all boats. But you've got to admit, Tom, in the 80s, most people couldn't get on the boat, and, and, the, and the water was awfully polluted. So, you, you know, these are, these are, this is ideological history, and, and, and so I, I want to touch a little bit about how crises unleash ideological history and ideological views. I, I, I sadly missed the, the earlier discussions. I, I had to just arrive before this panel, but somebody must have made reference to Ram Emanuel's paraphrase of, of Machiavelli that you shouldn't waste the crisis. This is an uh, unusual opportunity for transformative change that wouldn't normally be possible. Anyways, he said it, Machiavelli said it before, others have said it often. It is an opportunity for change, but there's no, a crisis is an opportunity for change. That also means it's a huge and inevitable opportunity for huge conflict, high drama, political theater, and that's what we're seeing in the South. So you're seeing people line up because all of the forces who see the opportunity for change are developing a change narrative, and all of the forces who hate the idea of change are developing another counter-narrative. And what you see in the States is you see a whole bunch of people who see this crisis, not a whole bunch, actually they're in the minority. They're in the minority everywhere, but a whole bunch who say, ah, that was too much government. Government trying to make mortgages more accessible. Government trying to force institutions to give, no government forced derivatives, no government forced pooling of risk, no government. But in any case, th there's one view, there's one view that says government, too much government. And there's another view where I would say sort of 98% of, of people are, <laughs> that's an exaggeration, it would be 94%. <laughs> <laughs> Another, another view that says the combination of, of, of greed and deregulation really put us in a hole, and, and the absence of government was the problem. Those two views compete. The, right now, because of who's in the administration, it seems to me that the greed uh, deregulation story is holding sway and, and, and government's back. Canada is it's, it's a totally different place. In, in Canada, our story is, the Canadian dominant narrative is, whoa. We did pretty well. No, we didn't do pretty well. We did less awfully than our, our <laughs> friends. We are coming out of it quicker and better than our friends. So we did less badly. Therefore, there's no reason for any fundamental alteration, no reason to, to change the, the rules of, of, of the game. Let's just focus on fiscal so consolidation and go back to the way we were. That, that's the story. That's Canadian narrative. And that crosses all the parties. I, I don't hear anybody saying very much differently. And there's reasons, there's reasons for satisfaction that we did do better than our friends. There's no quarreling there. That's absolutely empirically undeniable. There, there's some reasons to think it's premature to celebrate. So let's talk a little bit about what we can learn about why we did better. My take would be sl somewhat different, say, than Tom's. Let's talk about why we shouldn't celebrate. It might be premature. Complacency is fun, but celebration may be premature. The, so let's talk first about why did we do better. And I'll just talk about two reasons why I think we did better. Most analysts would say this. You, you, I think a, a, a lot of economists would agree at the very least. Number one, our banks were gold standard. They were well regulated. They were well supervised. I know Europeans and others are looking to our banks as kind of a model. People talk about it as a gold standard. So in the Canadian sense, government's not back. We never left. We have a single supervisory agency that does really good work. The regulations are really strong. And yes, it's true that our banks could have, had they, they chosen, 
taken a lot more risk than they have. There, there was room, but the, we, had a, we have a kind of prudential culture that has been criticized for decades and is now embraced as kind of world leading. In any case, government and the private sector in partnership found a kind of trial by error balance and maintained it for decades. Now, this is in the face of you know, the dominance of a neoconservative or free market liberal ethic that was dominating all the parties during that same period, during, during the 80s and 90s. Everybody was a kind of neoconservative or neoconservative wannabe. Everybody talked the language. But it's interesting, we did it the Canadian way, and the Canadian way was not to deregulate the financial institutions. Now, Paul's here and, and Michael, both of them will tell you how much pressure there was from inside and outside of government to make fundamental changes to the, re the regulation of our financial institutions. Huge pressure to allow for cross-pillar mergers, you know, insurance companies and banks, to allow for bank mergers, even foreign ownership. Huge pressure, and how often we were told that we were strangling the banks, making it impossible for them to compete, that we were strangling our financial institutions. We were killing Toronto. We were killing Canada. People were going to die. <laughs> and, and yet, and yet, in the Canadian way, we didn't do it. We didn't do it. And many of the people who are telling us that we were killing and strangling the financial institutions are the people who say, we are the gold standard, the world beaters. Interesting. No, nonetheless, that's one of the reasons I think we did well. And it's a good lesson to remember that, yes, the Canadian way has been to, with huge respect for the market. And yes, huge respect for the state and a belief that a strong market needs a strong state. So, it's one of the reasons we did well. Another reason we did well, and I think very few would dispute this, and I think Tom would agree with this, is our fiscal performance. The fact that our fiscal house was in order, that we had balanced the books. And the, I would argue that the two people who are most responsible for that are two of the, the people who are most responsible for that are in this room. One who set the table. <laughs> So one who set the table, one who served the meal. And, uh, and I think the, the resiliency it gave Canada, the, the strength it's given Canada is unmistakable. Now, you, you, there can be a lot of debates about how we did it. Um, part of it, we did it with, uh, on the basis of huge growth, US-inspired growth. That was kind of convenient, well-timed. Part of it was some tax instruments that were cre created by the previous government. GST was a, it delivered the goods. Part of it was very deep and, and uh, cuts that remain controversial and, and continue to play out, but arguably had to be done, ar but, but, there, but arguably. Um, <laughs> but we've had that argument. <laughs> I've lost every major argument that I've ever had. And, you know, Armin says that we, she doesn't know how the center works. Me neither. This. <laughs> so fiscal performance. But I would say I would say there's another reason. There's another reason that our fiscal performance was excellent, and that is we did not buy into the supply side management rhetoric on tax cuts. And think about it. The, the, the supply side economics argued, there was a kind of soft version and a hard version. The, the hard version said, you can cut taxes without paying for them. You don't have to have a source of funds to cut taxes because they're self-paying, right? Because they'll generate so much activity that they'll pay for themselves. Just look at the, the success in, in controlling the deficit that Reagan and Bush had following that. <laughs> The, the, the hard version was it would pay for itself, and I think mo very few economists would agree that that's good ec economics. But it's brilliant politics. It's brilliant politics. It got a lot of elections. It got a lot of Republicans elected, because think of what you're saying. You're, I'm saying you can have Swedish services and American taxes. Yes! <laughs> I've disconnected taxes from programs and services. I don't have to do with, with the connection. I can give you everything. You want all of it? 
<laughs> no problem. I can cut your taxes, I can, and, and it has nothing to do with services. Now, some, some conservatives would say, well, we never thought it would really pay itself, really, but it does give us a backdoor way to cut the services we don't like later on. We, we starve them in the midterms, and then when they're really eroded, and people turn up their head and say, oh, they're not working anyway, then we can cut them, but we can't cut them head on because people care about them too much. So in some ways, it's a backdoor way of cutting programs and services, or, bad economics, but in any case, Canada never bought into it. At least during the 90s and into the, early, the turn of the century, we did not cut taxes we didn't know how to pay for. And I think that's part of our fiscal performance. The first big cuts, 2000, <laughs> deep tax cuts in 2000, were done with the surplus and no more than half the surplus. So it was a different approach. That's part of the fiscal, fiscal balance. So there too, we didn't go as far, though I think we're getting there, of disconnecting taxes from the public goods and services they buy. And I think that's a very dangerous disconnect. When people disconnect taxes from the services, what you inevitably create is erosion of those services and a belief in a free lunch that's not available. So those are two of the reasons. Now, the fiscal performance, like it or, or gave us resiliency, was hugely important and got us through this. The strong banking system and even a prudential culture taken together, we did pretty well. But it's, why do I say it's too early to, to celebrate? Well, let me just itemize. Armin did a, a, a good job of it. Tom mentioned some of them. Just a few of the challenges that confront us going forward. One of them we know, a hyper-competitive uh, 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 global economy where the center, the locus of, of power is shifting to Asia. And we don't know how to manage that. That's real. Second, enormous household and provincial debt that we have no right to pass on to future generations. Put that in the context of an aging population that's not only going to put huge pressures on our health and social services, but downward pressures on our revenues because the proportion of workers is also going down. Add to that the uh, productivity gap that's widening, which means revenues are even going to be weaker if we don't figure out a way to break that downward cycle. Add to that climate change, where you know you can only you can only ignore it until we all melt. But sooner or later, sooner or later, as the melting begins, somebody's going to have to do something. And the world is going to do stuff, and, and we're going to at least have to play catch up. And then finally, but not last, in my view, deepening inequality. Um, you know, and quite frankly, in simple terms, you cannot afford to exclude a lot of people from productive labor when there's so few people working to create, to support a larger and larger dependent population. Now, you can pick, I gave you six, you can pick any three challenges your values and ideology prefer. But surely, business as usual, whichever three you pick, isn't going to do the trick. Now, coming out of the depression, out of the previous and bigger crisis, we had the beverage report in the UK. We had the Marsh Papers here that said, here's the long-term lessons that we can learn from this crisis that set the role for the state. And in both cases, they did set the role for the state. Marsh Paper set the, the agenda for building the social safety net and, and, and determined the role of government for decades, and pretty effectively, I would argue. Where's the equivalent? Now, it's interesting. In the UK, Cameron and Clegg have come up with the big society idea. I don't know how many of you are aware of it. A lot of people are seeing it as a way of downloading to the community, voluntary sector, charitable groups, and, and doing less government. But, and that's probably true. But put that aside. At least they've gotten past the Thatcher, Reagan um, view that countries are only the sum of the individuals in those countries, the sort of supreme individualism and transactionalism of those who follow Adam Smith, who, by the way, is is dead. The <laughs> um, just, I, 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 
<laughs> beverage is at tuna, and I, I, what a terrible way to break the news. The, um, <laughs> surely one of the, as we, as we try to define the, the role of the state going forward, surely we have to decide to some degree what kind of country we're looking for, and that's going to shape the state. And those who see the state as only the economy and, and say as Thatcher there is no such thing as society, they will have a particular vision. Those who think social justice isn't just an empty phrase, that social cohesion matters, that solidarity is also a legitimate social policy goal, they will have a different view. That's a fair debate. None of that debate's necessarily about big government or, or, or little government. And, and frankly, if you look at the size of government under Bush and Reagan, and we're not talking little government. I mean, we're talking big government. So it's, we're not talking size. We're talking about the role and purpose of government. And purpose has to, pre, has to come first. Purpose before size. And purpose comes to what kind of country, comes out of a sense of what kind of country you want. So, that's the kind of answer I have. Let's decide which of those challenges matter to us, what kind of country we want. Do we think it's all the economy stupid? Or no, no, it's, it's, it's solidarity, social cohesion stupid. I mean, or maybe it's both. And that's been the Canadian art. The Canadian art has understood that you can't share wealth if you don't grow it, but the biggest reason to grow it is to share it. That's been the Canadian art. That's been our strength. So. In that, what's the option of a, a failure to, for the late and, and lamented beverage or the, the absence of, of, of a framework? It's, it, it could be drift, but drift ain't going to be the answer. But it's worse than that. I think drift has direction in Canada. And the, the direction of drift in Canada is, well, thank you so much. The, the, <laughs> and, and, and for my next number, it's. <laughs> The direction in, 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 uh, of drift in Canada is the erosion of the public space. It's the erosion of the public space. We've seen the dramatic reduction in trust in government. Now, this is, I, I, I'm not talking about the paternalistic states over, the endless growth of governments over. Those days are done. Nobody's going to argue that. That's a straw man. Nobody's going to argue that. That's not the issue. And the notion that we've learned to, to n not be deferential, to push government back when it, when it touches our civil liberties. We don't want government in the bedroom. We want our private space. Although, you know, if we pause, thank goodness family violence is no longer private. But, so we've, we've wrestled and learned through trial and error the balance of public and private. We're not talking about big government. Two minutes? Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs> we're, we're not talking about big government. We are talking about what kind of government do we need to build a country that we have with respect for the, the unique things that mar only markets can do? It's not disrespectful of the market. It understands the market has no moral center. The market is the market. So you can trade in slaves or you can trade in commodities. The market's the market. Government and the market in partnership has been the Canadian magic. So do we want the gradual erosion of our social programs because we're afraid to talk about taxes? I don't think so, but that's where we're going. Do we want the erosion of our social programs because we won't stand up for public service? The public service has to reinvent itself, but surely it's not the enemy. Do we really want to choke off the information that's necessary to do government well, to work with civil society, to hold government accountable? I don't think so. So there are some immediate things that we have to do, which is an honest talk about taxes, an honest talk about about information and an honest talk about the value of public service, elected, not elected, and a real debate about what kind of country we want, not an ideological debate about big government versus small government. Thank you. Thank you.